Okay, here's a little uh, video showing what's new in version 0 0.7. So the main new stuff in this one is ramps, data processing, novelty, and time stretching. There's a couple of housekeeping things with this one. Um, so it's the first time I'm gonna have a breaking change, meaning that some of your existing patches may need to get reworked. Um, the main thing here is that uh, everything that used to have a separate control inlet, so things like Corpus Match, Corpus Player, a whole bunch of the objects took like the normal messages and they had a separate inlet for control stuff. All of that's been consolidated into a single inlet. Just this is me like working on the documentation and just getting everything ready for all that stuff, making it a bit more in line with the regular Max object behaviors. Um, I've also completely revamped the overview patch. It just got a little too big with all the tabs. It looked like the library does too much stuff now. So um, the, the tabs have been removed and I've also put all the tutorial videos here on the front page and labeled them a bit more clearly. So for new users, if you wanna find out about filtering, if you wanna find out about concatenation, et cetera, you can sort of click here and it'll actually jump you to that video. Um, so that's uh, kind of a, a revamp there. But yeah, that's the stuff that's new. Um, it's actually quite a bit more than I thought in, in the last video I said I wasn't, I didn't have too much more new stuff, but I had to chat with a couple buddies and um, yeah, there's a, quite a bit of new stuff in this version here. So I'm just gonna walk you through these things. So the first stuff is SP ramp and SP ramp tilde. So these are meant for um, working on like time-based things. So almost like a mini score or a mini sort of trajectory of, of things that you want to happen. So um, SP ramp is, is for event-based stuff and SP ramp tilde is for signal-based stuff. But I send it a function of some kind. So some kind of, uh, well, using the function object, but I'm sending it this specific ramp. And now when I give it onsets and stuff, <clears throat> in this case, it's gonna move from this point to that point in 50 events. So that's basically 50 onsets in this case. So it can take uh, triggers, bangs, signals, or whatever. Um, and you can see here, it's sending that ramp. It does it forwards, it does it backwards, and it does a palindrome. And it also outputs the position. Um, then you have a bunch of parameters here, whether it's gonna loop, whether you can pause it where it is, um, whether you wanna jump to somewhere specifically, whether you wanna speed it up or down, whether you wanna reset to the beginning, etc. So the idea with this one is that you can set up a kind of trajectory that you want, a ramp that you want, how many events you want to get from here to here, and then use this to map to stuff. So I'll show you a couple examples here. So this one here, I'm gonna load a corpus. I'm gonna load up a setup. I'll load two ramps. So in this one, I have two ramps. I have uh, this one over here and this one over here. Both are sent to 174 events, which just so happens it's how many are in this example, but you can set it to whatever you want. and. I'm using that to control the filtering on this corpus. So as it's gonna start playing through this, it's gonna start changing the, um, the available centroid using this function here, and it's gonna start changing the available time centroid. So basically how long the file sounds, or the matched thing, using this here. And you'll see with each matching, the available um, points in the corpus change. So per query, it's, it's changing the sort of available pool. So over the course of this video, or video, over the course of this audio example, it's gonna go through both of these functions simultaneously. So that sounds like this. So you can see that as it was shifting each time, so it kind of gives me, even though it's matching the nearest match, it's giving me an overall shape or trajectory to the type of things, the type of material that's getting matched. Here I'm using two ramps, you can use more ramps, you can attach it to different kind of filters, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, Here I'm doing a similar kind of thing, but for the concatenation. In this example here, I'm using it to affect the playback parameters. So over the course of this audio file, I won't play the whole thing, um, it's gonna sort of massage, so the rate, Sorry, the, the pitch that's getting um, affected over time. And then this one is doing, I believe, the starting point. So I'll just play a bit of this one.
you can see as I get more onsets here, these parameters are slowly changing, slowly changing. Actually, it's changing all four parameters for this example. And so on. So um, the idea is to affect the trajectories over time, but based on onset. So if I have no onsets for a while, um, it won't move to the next point until you do the next one. So that's SP ramp. SP ramp tilde is a similar idea to SP ramp, but it works with um, signal rate envelopes. And it's actually very similar to the max 8.3 object ramp, even though it's completely different under the hood. Um, so I can put this thing in here and when I play, you can see it's creating um, a signal rate version of that function. As before, forwards, backwards, palindrome, you can have it re-trigger or not re-trigger. You can have it loop or not loop. You can set the duration, so I wanted to have it over 500 milliseconds. Um, you can pause it. Um, you can affect the speed of it. Um, you can jump around it, etc. So it's a lot of the same. It's not exactly the same features in both of them, but it, it's very similar features in both of them. So with this one, you can start doing some interesting, well, you can do interesting stuff with both of them. But with this one, I'm just going to walk you through a couple of the musical examples. So here I have one ramp that's triggering this function here. And then underneath it, I'm just using a vanilla sample and hold. So I'm literally um, triggering it from the gate of this one. Actually, I'm triggering it. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. I'm triggering it from the trigger. So the trigger is um, triggering this ramp and then also triggering the sample and hold. And then I have this set up to uh, sort of a, a take on the uh, Whimsical Raps Just Friends uh, module. So that's what's going on here. So along the top, you can see the, um, the curvy function that's being uh, generated by that. And then on the bottom is the sample and hold version of it. Okay, so here's one uh, doing some FM synthesis. So I'm doing a new random function and then that function is being used to modulate um, just like a super simple, like vanilla um, FM synth. But you get some kind of interesting sounds with this. And I can change the envelope shape or the, the duration at which it goes through this. And what's cool with this one is if I pause it, um, the position changes almost like a sample and hold because the internal ramp that's in each version of it updates when there's a new ramp put into it. So this is actually paused and frozen, but the internal ramp is changing every time. So you kind of get some interesting toggles if you freeze it. And obviously you can not use random functions. Um, here's a similar one with the corpus matching. Um, in this one, yeah, the pitch is going to go down and, and the start position is going to change. So you can see this is what's happening now with the speed. And this is happening over the course of 45 seconds and the start position of the sample is jumping up and then down and up and down. Um, and that's affecting this one. So we get these kind of, uh, uh, again, I can set a sort of a trajectory, a map for how I want things to go. Um, this also works really well with the new novelty stuff. So I'll explain this separately, but I, we have novelty detection now as well. Um, but just as a short preview of that, uh, it detects changes in types of material, not necessarily per event. So in this case, I'll just start a sequencer. So it's just doing kind of like a random sequence thing here. Um, here it's changing material slowly. So every time the material changes, which you can kind of view in the waveform here, it triggers the thing, the ramp. So um, it pairs well, uh, pairs well with novelty as you can use it instead of like per attack, which is kind of cool as well as you saw in the other examples. But here, whenever there's a change in type of material, it um, triggers a novel. All right, and finally, uh, even though it wasn't originally built for this, since it is audio rate, you can use it as a wavetable um, oscillator. So here there's a couple, so there's a ramp up top, which is being used as an oscillator. So I'm setting like a, a random waveform each time. And then there's a separate um, ramp in here that's being used as an envelope. So there's a, this is the oscillator, and then this is the envelope that's being, um, it's driving the, there's a couple effects here. There's a filter and some overdrive. So that sounds like this. So you can see the random wave table um, oscillator that's being built, and then this is the waveform as it comes up the bottom of the system here. Well, before the filters itself. 
So we get this kind of sound that it is before you can kind of... Whether it re-triggers or not, you can pause it. You can turn re-trigger off and then just put it on loop, and then eventually this uh, turns into like an LFO. So this is using this now as an LFO, so you can mess around with these settings and, and so on. So that's SP ramp tilde. So the ramp objects are, um, the idea with those is to give you um, some tools to be able to map out larger trajectories. So either by events with SP ramp or by duration with SP ramp tilde. And you can use it for short durations or minutes long or whatever. Um, the next thing is there's all these data objects. So this is, um, was a new turn, and I, I think it's, well, I'll show you the examples, it's kind of interesting. The idea with these is that you can take um, descriptor data, for the most part, and then manipulate it in ways that um, you might normally do to audio. So um, data bending is like a general purpose one that gives you a few options to do things. So at the top here, I'm playing the same exact hit over and over. So if I turn variation down, you can see the descriptors, the melt bands, and the MFCC. So this is the typical um, descriptor stuff we have elsewhere in, in SP tools. So SP data bending gives you options to do a few things to it. So from I can add a certain amount of variation. So since it's the same note over and over, you can see it's kind of manipulating them a little or by a lot. Okay, so this can give you like just a little bit of randomness for the different things. I can also rotate it. Um, which for, can have pretty drastic things for some uh, parameters. I can affect the resolution. So this is almost like bit crushing. So um, you can see it sort of down samples the available space there. You can see it the most on the mail bands there, but it's, it's pretty extreme, the changes there. Um, and then dropouts. This one you won't visually see, but it just a certain amount of hits won't get through. So if I'm doing that with corpus playback, so here I've got a load of corpus and I'll put it to play the beginning. So this is the descriptors before as they're being analyzed and this is the descriptors after. So that's that, so if I crank the variation up, you can see it's sort of altering it by a certain amount and it just gives you slightly different matching. Even though the incoming audio is the same, in this case I'm just looping the, the start of this example, it gives me that. Um, the rotation one has on descriptors a pretty dramatic impact. As you can see, I'm kind of shifting things over, but because descriptors is like loudness, is in centroid, and all these things are kind of being interchanged, you hear you can hear it's like quite a bit louder than it normally would or quite a bit brighter. Um, with rotation, for most stuff, doing just a little bit of a of shift has a big impact. Um, resolution will do uh, kind of yeah, as I said in the previous one, bit crushing, so things will be more quantized to larger chunks. Um, so a little bit of a subtle impact. It depends on the material that you're working with. And then dropouts, um, this one you can see a certain amount of hits just won't make it through. So in this case, like 90% of the hits are not happening. So this is useful to just sort of make it so like my audio is, is coming through, but like I'm only gonna get some of the, the things matched. So it's like almost equivalent of setting like a really, really low sensitivity. Okay, here I have a granular synth example. So I'm gonna load the corpus. Okay, and I'm gonna play this here. So this is the SP data granular, which I'll explain in, in a moment, but I'm just gonna turn it on and it's, it's playing back just sort of like a stuck note there. And then here I have some control over parameters here so I can add a certain amount of variation. So without it, it's literally just kind of repeating that one hit per thing. So here it gives me a little bit of wiggle room. I can also mess around with dropout so it doesn't do all of them. And then in this case, I'm doing some um, time stretching, which again, I'll explain in, in an ups upcoming one. Um, so all of these things you can combine to do a, a kind of accompaniment. So I'll get all this stuff going here. So I've loaded uh, two corpora. So for one of them, I'm just playing back just straight up and we're gonna get the normal matching as we would. Here I'm using um, a delay one, which I'll explain in a second as well. But then I'm using data bending to add a certain amount of variation to that. So by doing this, I'm basically gonna get um, a 10 second delayed version of an accompaniment. So I'll just play it this. So this has been going for a bit. 
and now this is doing um, a delayed and um, bent version of that data from the beginning. So it's almost like a, a self accompaniment. So if I stop this here, this will keep going because it's uh, basically on, on, at this point, there's like an eight second delay and I can just clear it. So that's data bending. It lets you um, massage some of the numbers in, in different ways. Um, next here we have data delay. I'm just going through these in alphabetical order, not necessarily the order that you might um, want to use them. So data delay, it does kind of what it says on a tin. It takes incoming descriptor data, but then applies like a delay to them, like a, like a delay pedal style delay, and specifically like an analog delay. So there's a little bit of a roll off of the highs. So if I play this here, um, you can kind of see that it gets a little visually uh, messy because the display doesn't update very quickly or it doesn't update at the rate at which it's actually happening. You can kind of get the idea of what's happening with the melt bands. It repeats in this case with 130 millisecond delay, but we get that kind of roll off of material. So what does that sound like? Let me load a corpus here and we get like what sounds quite convincingly like a kind of a delay. So you get like those sort of echoes and they get darker and quieter. But what's happening is that's actually the descriptor data that's being delayed. Meaning that um, even though it sounds like the first hit is just getting darker and quieter, it's actually matching different points, which you can see on the, the chart down there. And like with any delay, I can affect the delay time. The amount of feedback. So very little feedback or a lot of feedback. And the amount of roll off. So if I put it to kind of like a middle delay and put like a lot of feedback, but not very much roll off, you see it's a lot more of the same kind of note being very loud and present. But if I put more of roll off, it gets darker a lot quicker. Now I apply this to the different descriptors. So here it is being applied to SP descriptors. I can also do the same with the Mel bands. And even though this sounds just like a vanilla delay here, it's actually the data that's being delayed. Which is quite cool. Um, and as with the other example, I can kind of use it as an accompaniment. So I've got this here, load this here, put a 10 second delay on it. Um, in this case, I have the feedback set to zero, meaning that it'll only play at once. And like before, I'll just put this at play. So this is doing some matching here. And um, then after 10 seconds, it's gonna start doing this one. So I'll just wait until this one starts playing here. All right, and there it goes. So now this is doing this one as an accompaniment and that'll do its own thing. Again, as before, I can apply variations and dropouts and all that. So uh, I'll just stop that one there and hit clear. Okay, up next we've got data granular. So this um, applies a kind of thinking of almost like a granular synth where you select a point, but then it'll repeat that point very quickly, almost like a granular synth would. So I just have that one note here, um, it's repeating. But if I turn on the, the granular, um, you can see it's spitting that note out. Well, you can't see, but it's spitting it out very quickly. I can set the rate at which it spits it out. Um, I can set it, the amount of variation. So this is similar to the data bending. So you can see the variation there. Um, and whether the, uh, the timing is random. Okay, so in terms of musical context, oops, let me stop that there. So um, here I have just the, oops, gotta load the corpus. Yeah. Um, so I'm just playing the beginning, so this is before. So if I turn on the granulator, whatever the last hit it gets, it just sort of repeats that over and over. And I can set the variation. So if I put the variation at zero, it's literally just doing the same hit over and over at a rate that I can set. And I can also set whether the timing is random. So like this will add a certain amount of variation to that rate. So it's kind of like a bit of that, and with a bit of variation. Okay. And I can use this now with some of the other stuff. So um, I'm gonna show in, in uh, upcoming now that um, we can now do time stretch. So in this example here, I'll load this up here. I'm using data granular um, and I'm gonna be doing that sort of repeated note, but I'm using a corpus here with um, time stretching on using the extreme stretch algorithm, which is kind of like a pulse stretch sound with the speed very slow. So that sounds like this. Yeah. 
So it's almost like a pseudo spectral freeze where like it's kind of doing very fast matching. So use it to create kind of like a dynamic uh, stutter stutter effect. So in this example, um, um, I have a rate here of 75 with the random timing, and uh, it's basically toggling on and off the the granularization. So it'll well, you'll hear. And you can also add variation like the other ones. So it's kind of a cool way to give you a sort of a, a kind of a delay flavored thing, but more like a stuck repeating type of thing instead of the, like what you would get with the delay. Um, data looper. So this one does again like the other one is does what it says on the tin. It's basically like a looper, but for um, descriptor stuff. So I can record a loop, hit end to record, and then I can play. So this is the loop that's there. I can do the speed of it. I can go forward, I can go reverse. I can stop, I can clear. So a lot of the, the features that you might have with a, just a vanilla looper. So I'll load a corpus. I'll play a bit of audio here. I'll hit record. So at the moment I'm recording, 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 recording. I'll hit end. So I'll stop this here. So now I can play that bit back. And you get a sync out right here, which you can use you know, use to time with other processes. But what's cool here is I can affect the playback speed. So I'm affecting the playback speed of the incoming descriptors, not the audio. So you can hear that the gesture is happening faster, but the pitch isn't changing. And I can go reverse. So again, the audio isn't playing backwards, but the incoming descriptor stream is being played backwards. So it's kind of an interesting way to deal with stuff. So I can use this now to capture um, stuff for other processes. So here I've got um, the classifier. So I'll, uh, I'll hit record and I'll play some incoming. So that's the example from uh, the classifier thing. I'll hit end. So I've basically recorded the MFCCs, which I can now play back. And as before, I can play the speed. So I can capture for different types of stuff, so, and I can also capture uh, very, very fast stuff. So, so in this case, um, I'm recording the concatenation stuff, and this happens at like yeah, at a, at a much higher rate. So I'll play here. Okay, so I've captured a loop, so now I can play it back. So that's kind of cool, but I can also. But what's cool is since this is um, the data, it's happening independently. So I, I put the, I'll put it to like, let's say 50. So I'm doing a half speed here. But now I can mess with the parameters. So I'm decoupling basically the incoming um, gestural data from the way that you process it. So that's data looper. And the last one of data objects is data transpose. Um, so before I'm gonna play just with the first note here as an example. So um, as a few parameters, so one is just transpose. So this applies to every, every descriptor and every descriptor type. So you can see it's kind of shifting things upward. And then for the descriptor, like vanilla descriptors on its own, you can transpose just the loudness, just the centroid, just the flatness or just the pitch. Um, so if I have that with corpus matching, this starts getting useful because if I loop this beginning bit, so I have this. So let's say I have the incoming audio, but like I want to have it match just overall quieter stuff. I can just turn the loudness down. 
So it's still matching, but you can see that, well, this, this slider here is what corresponds to loudness. It's doing the matching, but just finding quieter versions of it. Or let's say the same thing, I have this section, but I wanted to find overall brighter things. I'll just crank the center up. This is a somewhat small corpus, so it doesn't have the, a gigantic impact here, but you can use this to shape the, the selectiveness of certain parameters, right? So I, I want this gesture, but I want overall things to be, uh, let's say, louder but darker. So here it's, it's finding much louder samples. As opposed to just the vanilla matching here. Or I can just transpose everything up and down. So just moreness, which means it'll be louder, brighter, more centroid. It's kind of getting stuck in that one area because that's, it's, as I said, it's not a gigantic corpus. Um, I also do the same with Mel bands. Now at this point, it starts getting a little abstract because, for example, I can turn up um, loudness. That's that's sort of like a, a conceptual thing that makes sense. But what does um, transposing Mel bands mean? So um, what I've done is this. So it's just that one note over and over. So what I do is I kind of shift the whole thing over and then what I add to the space that's missing is um, an average of uh, the available ML bands, which I think kind of perceptually sort of works. So to me, this sounds like I'm transposing the filter up. So that's what I do with ML bands. And then here's a musical example. So I'll load a corpus. Um, I'll record a gesture here, the beginning gesture. Uh, okay, so I'll just loop that beginning gesture. I'll speed it up a bit just to have a little fun. So it, the, the data is what's being recorded here, but now I can transpose that data. So the gesture is still coming out. It's the same, in this case, the same rhythm, the same kind of descriptive data, but I'm massaging the, the, the range in which the descriptors are going to the matching algorithm, which affects the timbre and the, the sort of notes being matched here, which is kind of cool because I'm looping this one section. But I can affect the, the matching, the results that I get from it. Okay, so that's the last of the data ones. Um, the other things are a little bit smaller. So we have now um, novelty um, detection. So novelty is a specific kind of algorithm that um, differentiates between things, well, different algorithms. So you can do it for um, the overall, uh, the spectrum, MFCC, chroma, pitch, and loudness. So here I've got it set to MFCCs. Um, so here, So you can hear with the audio example, I'm playing different types of material. And this is the, um, the novelty curve that's coming out here. So you can set the threshold, the overall um, window size, the lockout amount and all that kind of stuff. Um, but this is very useful for telling differences between types of material. So instead of having like a per onset, like here's an attack, here's an attack. I wanna know just sometimes that like, okay, I've changed from playing this kind of sound to that kind of sound. And you can do that with different algorithms here. Now, because it, it does stuff with windows and other stuff like this, it's not the fastest algorithm. So SP onset will always give you a very crisp attack. This, depending on your window size, will add a certain amount of latency. Um, but with this, it lets you do stuff that you can't do with SP onset. So for me, I'm thinking that this is useful with, let's say like the ramps where you wanna have um, things change over a slower period of time. So when I'm doing metallic sounds, I can set the threshold just right here and that's doing that. But then when I go to another type of sound, um, it will give me a trigger. And with the other objects, like with Espionza, you get bangs, triggers, and gates out of it. Um, and here I've got an example. So I'll get this going. I'll get a sequencer. So this is a sample that I had before. So the sequencer going. So when it changes from this type of material to this type of material, it triggers this ramp. So you see, it's not triggering every single attack. It's triggering whenever there's um, a new bit of novelty from that specific set of settings. So that's novelty. And then the last thing, which is kind of small in terms of um, what it adds, but it actually adds a, a lot of um, 
potential in terms of overall sound availability. So SP Corpus Player, I've changed the, the playback guts of it inside in a way that won't affect um, your patches. But we now have time stretching. So if I load a Corpus, I play things back. I have all the same features as I had before. I can affect the speed, um, the starts, the length, um, all that kind of stuff. So the same thing that we've had for a while, but now I can enable time stretching. So if I enable time stretching, I can now affect the pitch independently of the speed. And similarly, the speed independent of the pitch. And you have um, a choice of different algorithms here. So basic, monophonic, rhythmic, general, um, extreme stretch, and efficient. So these can kind of combine in cool ways where I can set this, put a very low speed. Um, let's say put the pitch kind of high. We get this kind of like high bright thing, which I can then combine with playing back just a short portion of it and putting a bit of a fade. So this kind of opens up some interesting um, timbral possibilities that you didn't have before. And this is also propagated out, so the, um, the Corpus player in max for live now has this as well. Um, so yeah, that's, um, that's version 0.7. Um, as I said at the start, I, I, there are some breaking changes, so some of your patches you may have to update, but all of that is because I'm still working on adding all the help files and references and all that kind of stuff, which I, I'm hoping we'll have by version 0.8. It's just very time consuming to do that for, I mean, there's now like 45 objects or something like that. It's, it's, quite, it's quite big. Um, but there you go, some new stuff. Enjoy, let me know what you think.